again and welcome to another episode of Bonnie's Insider presented by Universal Primary Care. In this edition, we'll catch up with a Bonnie's alum who spent part of her summer at the Tokyo Olympic Games, mic up athletes at their practices to go behind the scenes of our soccer programs, get an update from other fall sports on campus, and hear the moving story of a Bonnie who traveled across the globe to get to St. Bonaventure. First up though, this week we saw the conference TV schedule released, which will see the St. Bonaventure men's basketball team featured nationally throughout the season. The Bonnies will be on national TV a whopping 13 times during Atlantic 10 play and nearly 20 times in all, counting non-conference games. Let's take a quick look at what Bonnies fans have to look forward to with the season tipping off in November. Staying on the court, our alumni spotlight this week features a Bonnie's women's basketball graduate who has reached the highest level of sport, doing so as an official. This week, we meet with class of 2008 graduate M.P. Malo, a Montreal native who, after a four-year playing career at Bonas, is one of the top FIBA officials in the world. And this summer, she earned a selection to officiate both men's and women's games at the Tokyo Olympic Games. When I graduated from Bonaventure in 08, I came back home in Canada and I wanted to stay close to the game. So I started coaching and I went to get the first class to be a referee. Actually, I started in 2008 and I had the opportunity within like three years to attend a camp for a potential referee at the FIBA level, which is international level. From that camp, you go through like all the testing. So it's physical tests, written and test on court assessment. If you qualify, they, they recommend you to your country to represent. I got recommended to Canada to be one of the FIBA referees. And from 2011, I had an opportunity every summer to be on the court and to attend the international uh, events which gave me the opportunity to progress, to get to a once a lifetime opportunity this summer at the Olympics. So I ended up doing six games on the floor and I was one game, I call it a standby. We're dressed and we're right behind the monitors. And if there's any situation that needs help with a review of, of the play, we're ready to, to assist. And the six other games, I had a, one opportunity to do a men's game, which was the, the Team USA against the Czech Republic. Then my five other games were women's including the, the quarterfinals, semifinals, and the gold final between Team USA and Japan. Can't forget because it was a great game. I didn't wake up one morning and oh, I'm in the Olympics, right? There was other steps before that that prepared me to be there. And this is one of the proudest feelings that I have is that I felt good out there. I felt that I belong and I, I wasn't surprised. Obviously, there's many stuff that we want to improve, but most of it is just I was at the right place at the right moment. The officiating crew were like 30, 31 officials. And the first day we went in the gym just to make a tour, just to see like how it looks, like uh, the court, the, the table and stuff. And it was like, wow, like the place was empty. The lighting was bright, everything sharp, shiny. Uh, just the feeling to be there, like paparazzi and taking pictures everywhere, just with all the Tokyo signs and just make it like, okay, it's a reality. We're here, like this is, it's going on. And we had many, many steps, obviously with the COVID situation, with the testing, with like, you know, name it. And just to be there on the floor, it was just magical. At the end of March, beginning of April in 2020, this is when it was official that unfortunately the Olympics was postponed and maybe canceled, we didn't know. We had to stay put and continue to work hard, even if you, we didn't know if it would happen or not. This year in the same time, like February and March, they reconfirmed the, the nomination. And not all the officials that were on the initial list were called upon again. So I was fortunate that my name was still on the list, even if I didn't have referee for like 12, 15 months. Unfortunately, in Canada, we didn't have any uh, competition. So it was kind of hard to uh, to stay stay involved, stay close and prove that I still belong there. So I think this summer for a lot of people, it made a lot of positive in their life. The athletes, the coaches, everybody that was involved, like the volunteers that were there, everybody lived something very positive in a weird uh, situation that, you know, for the last 18 and 19 months that we're now uh, facing. I don't know if Coach Crowley remember, but we did a scrimmage. There was two officials, probably local officials. Apparently the whole game, I was kind of arguing with the ref, say, oh, she was out of bounds. Oh. 
how come it was not a push? Or then at the end, they made a tape, a mixtape of all the time that I was just arguing with the, the ref or just demanding something that was like, hey, you need to pay attention to other stuff. This is not what you need to be doing. And they just spotlight this. And I didn't feel like I was doing it. So maybe that was one of the startup of, okay, I was seeing the game differently. At a young age, there's always something that interests me. I didn't know it, but I was uh, an official at heart, even when I was young. Bonaventure, it's a, it's a small university, but you know, we make big things. Like you go, you see around the years, you look, you go back and we're able to surprise people and do the impossible. Even if people don't believe in you, if you believe in yourself, you work hard, you can make it happen. Even if you're a small university, like you're, if you, even if you're somebody from Montreal, Quebec, a French Canadian, that you can, you can make it to the Olympics. Like it's in me for the time I, I had there. I read a quote somewhere and I felt like it really resonated to me because of you, I know I can. You can reach the highest level, not only as an athlete. And I'll be honest, my first dream was to be at the Olympics as an athlete. I, I was a little girl, I was watching the Olympics on TV. I was like, wow, I was so impressed. And back then when I started officiating, I didn't know it was possible to represent your country and to do like many worldwide events like this and when they get to the Olympics. So if I can be that person that could inspire one or two or three person, I mean, this is something very uh, unique and special. MP is back at her full-time job working as a teacher and basketball coach and still refing games locally on nights and weekends. She's looking forward to getting games back going in Canada following the pandemic sports shutdown. Bonnie's men's soccer season is underway and one of their regular contributors is junior Peter Massaqua. Peter's family was separated by war in Sierra Leone, escaping to find a better life. Here in the United States, soccer has been instrumental in finding a comfort level at his new home, St. Bonaventure. My mom, she she's a Sierra Leonean. Um, my family is my family is from Sierra Leone. Then we were in a refugee camp in Nigeria. I grew up with my mom alone because my dad was dead when I was young. She had war in the country in Sierra Leone. She never talked to her family because they thought she was dead in Sierra Leone. But the whole time she was in Nigeria, so she didn't have contact with her family. My mom couldn't choose repatriation because she don't know where her family whereabouts is. So she had to choose resettlement. That's the only way she could resettle and look for a family later on when she has resettled. We went to the UNHCR, the United Nations, to help my mom because my mom was a refugee in the United States and she has a seizure problem. In order to help her, because she, she can't take care of us by herself, they had to find a way to help her in the third country so she could be balanced with me and my little brother. Getting to the U.S. was, it was a little difficult because the process of the United Nations, it takes time because they have to like be sure if you're really the person and like they give people the, um, the countries based on what whatever country accepts you. They have Canada, they have U.S., they have like other countries that accept refugees. So normally we're supposed to go to Canada, my mom was pregnant for my little brother, so they had to switch it. They had to look for another country, then the United States accepted us. She sent someone on Facebook to go to like the family house to look for the brothers. When they got to the family house, nobody was there. Then they keep searching, then somebody, somebody called the name and they were like, yeah, that's my sister, she's, she's dead already. But my mom was like, nah, that's me. They didn't believe her till she, she called them on Facebook um, video call and they saw her and they were like, we thought you were dead. And cause she left her mom when she was like three, so she thought her mom was alive, her father was alive, but they were both dead already. She was really young. She was like 12, 11, experiencing the war. She heard gunshots, other stuff. She had horrible experience. Living in Sierra Leone, she didn't live in a peaceful, like, peaceful note. Now she's obviously in, in a better state. I talked to her brother. He speaks, he speaks English. I was surprised. Huh? And he was like asking me, how are you? You don't really know me like that. He didn't know my mom had a kid. My mom was the youngest in the family. So they were surprised she has two kids already and one is already grown. They were, they were really surprised and they were happy for seeing her. She's alive and She's doing good. So sometimes she calls them and just talk to them and see how they are. I grew up in Nigeria my whole life. Coming here, I didn't really know anyone. The first two months, I was just in the house, didn't know anything. Soon as you come newly from the from um, Africa, you don't go to school right away. They have to like find everything for you, like what grade you are, find a, um, a school for you. And so I was just in the house with my mom. My mom knew someone from Africa here, so he bought me a soccer ball, so I just go outside my house and just kick around. I love playing soccer since I'm like since I've been growing up. I've been playing since I'm like five. Soccer helped me a lot because most people I met was through soccer. Because my first 
here in the US, I played Westside International Soccer. Some of my friends they were Africans like me, so they understood me better and they helped me a little bit. But I met them like in the gym, soccer gym. We were playing and the coach just saw me, he's like, oh, this kid is good. Come meet your other friends, they play soccer, so we started playing. In Africa, we don't really play soccer in an organized way. We don't really play in competition and we don't have age group. I was like 12 playing with 21 year olds, 18 year olds. Came here, told me how the system works and how I could get better in my game and what I'm doing wrong and how it's different to adapt to like the system, how to get better as a soccer player. In Africa, you just, the best dribbler is mainly the best player because nobody's playing for like anything. You just play for fun. To me, I was like, I'm like, oh, that's, that's what we do. Just take the ball and try to beat everyone. But when you play an organized game, it's different. No matter how good you are, you have to pass the ball. You have to get, to the, get used to the system. So I was at Empire United Academy. My coach is looking at my decision and everything. Alvin tested me. He talked, about, talked to me about coming to Bonaventure and how the college is. After Alvin tested me, I was going to St. Mary's High School. The principal, he was a St. Bonaventure alum. He talked to me about the school. He showed me the priest and I'm a Catholic. And in Nigeria, I was in a Catholic home, Franciscan of the Immaculate. I was close to them. I used to live with the brothers. I was a Catholic, so making my choice was in the heart. I'm really grateful because like everything I do now is because of her. That's why I try to make the best choice I can make. And whenever I'm doing something, I always think of her before I make my choice. I don't want myself to go through the, the stress she went through. She's already happy now. I'm, I'm moving forward a little bit, trying to achieve my dream. And I don't want to like, do something that's going to make her depressed or get her in a bad state that she don't want to be. So I was just trying to be the best I can be. Peter and his teammates have been putting in the work through the non-conference play this summer. As the calendar turns to fall, Atlantic 10 play gets underway with the Bonnies kicking off the conference schedule last weekend. Let's take a look inside of Bonnie's practice in this mic'd up segment with senior Jazeel Thompson. Serious? I don't know, someone always taking my water bottle, man. It's never where I leave it. Hey, watch your AK have my water bottle. Someone took mine. You don't see the big number five? Well, someone took mine. <laughs> yeah, we gotta keep this away from some people. Wait, away from you? Luca. Keep it PG, man. We got bonnet fans that are kids, yeah? <laughs> Holy. Yeah, the editor got a lot of work to do on this. All right, focus up. Freddy, John, turn, John, turn. JJ, left. Good. Yes, grab a stretch, boys. It's hotter than Jamaica. It's hotter than Jamaica. Jamaica not even this hot. We have that nice island breeze. Fred! Hunter! Game like Fred! John, turn! Good. Actually, really good. Yeah, good stuff, boys. Smells like hard work. That's what we're gonna say for the camera. Good. Hey, lock him! Much better this time, boys. Yo, it's probably the mic. I'll be sc I scored some bangers in that. Oh, mic me up more often, man. <laughs> mic me up in them games. Yo, let's go before them bugs come out, man. Yes. Yeah, come on Mitch, get up. And that's what you just gotta do, like, before you get the ball, like, you check your surroundings. Yeah, you know, and just, just keep working. And don't, don't be too hard on yourself, yeah? Good stuff to the boys, good intensity. Family on three, one, two, three, family. family. It's time for a quick break, but when we return, we'll head over to the Energy Mark Coach's Corner to meet new women's soccer assistant coach, Sarah Yunez. You're watching Bonnie's Insider, presented by Universal Primary Care. Schultz is always at your service, ensuring your vehicle gets the maintenance it requires. Now, with modern, touchless options across the entire auto care experience. 
Speak with a service advisor on the phone or at one of our newly envisioned service centers. Pay invoices online or via mobile app. And drive home in confidence knowing Schultz only permits limited personnel access to your vehicle. Exceeding expectations is our mission. That's why the next generation of auto care is already here at Schultz. Western New York is known for energy innovation. Today, Energy Mark is leading the way for the next generation of renewable energy. At Energy Mark, we help power Western New York homes and businesses with low cost, locally produced energy, including renewables like solar and wind power. Energy Mark, the official energy supplier to the Buffalo Bills. Connect your account to Energy Mark at buylocalenergy.com. The women's soccer team opened up Atlantic 10 play this past weekend, and on the sideline is a new face, assistant coach Sarah Younes, who joined head coach Steve Brodarski's staff this summer after a standout college career at Messiah University, as well as work on staff at Eastern Kentucky. In this edition of the Energy Mark Coach's Corner, we meet one of the newest members of the Bonnies family. I'm from Dillsburg, Pennsylvania, so it's like 15 minutes south of Harrisburg. My family is Colombian. I don't look the part, but very much love the game of soccer and grew up watching it and grew up competing. I was probably the only person willing enough to play in goal. Ended up being kind of good at it. Played club all my life growing up, played in high school, and was lucky then to go on to play at Messiah, then college, now Messiah University. Best days for sure, it was, it was a really good time. It was a lot of work, a lot of energy and effort, and then surrounded by a team of people who support encourage, make you want to do the work. And then obviously having those experiences as a player and, and seeing where hard work gets you translates into how I coach, into the effort and energy I want to put into the team. Having the relationships that are centered on vulnerability and honesty and a willingness to put team over self, I think is something that I try to instill in every team environment that I'm at as a coach as well. First and foremost, success isn't an accident. Excellence is the repeated doing of things that are really ordinary by themselves over and over again. You have the staff of people who are working for one goal, which is to make the team the best possible team they can be. And then the investment into the girls, into who they are as people first and foremost, um, which then translates into I can invest and have high expectations of them on the field. I was a nursing major actually, and I just couldn't get away from the game is probably the truth. I was finding every excuse to be a nurse and coach, to be whatever and coach. And then I had some really good people in my life just encourage me to just to, to go for it and to make uh, what I think the, the deepest passion is the thing that professionally I can pursue. So really thankful for those people who pushed me in the right ways and really thankful for the experiences I've had so far. I gotta say the Bonnie Nation, like the, the family atmosphere that people talk about in the interview process is palpable when you're on campus. Steve, his ability as a coach tactically to understand the game and then his persona and personality, like he's a person who believes in deep investment and deep relationships. And I think you see that in the way that he interacts with players on and off the field. Office doors always open. Players wanna come up and, and talk about film, they want to talk about life. To have alumni consistently at games speaks a lot about the character of a coach and the way that he invests in a culture of a program, which was really, really important to me. Looking at any job, that, that's going to be the number one question is what type of atmosphere do you create for the girls? Um, do you care about them as people? Just because that was so important in my experience as a player and has been in my experience as a coach. I and mean, I know the power that just having good chemistry and bought in and invested relationships I know what that can do on the fields in combination with the entire department having that sort of family atmosphere um, is just is so important. It makes me feel welcome, makes me feel part of the family, um, and I've really appreciated that. Updating more Bonnie's fall sports, two standout athletes have been honored for their outstanding starts to the year. Golf grad student Christian Chapman earned Atlantic 10 Golfer of the Week accolades this past week after setting the program record with a round of 65 at the VCU shootout. He has posted a scoring average of 70.8 over the first eight rounds of the year. On the cross-country course, freshman Clay Peets became the first Bonnie's men's runner to receive Atlantic 10 Rookie of the Week honors in back-to-back -back weeks. In his first two collegiate meets, he set Bonnie's all-time top five times in both the 5K and the 8K. From current Bonnie's to Bonnie's alumni, we leave you this week with scenes from last week's baseball and softball alumni gatherings on campus. For these former Bonnie student-athletes, the saying is true, once a Bonnie, always a Bonnie. Until next time, 
Thanks for joining us, and go Bonnies! Oh, I know.